Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Spirit and Truth Sanctuary. Good to see you guys tonight. We are in a little bit different location. I've got my microphone. Look, look I can twirl with it. I can, I can dance with it like a snake. <laughs> I have so much more room for activities. <laughs> uh, I am at the fellowship hall tonight because uh, Pastor Brandy is... Uh, still out of town working, and so I want to say thank you to uh, Benny Grizel and to Pastor LaDonna for making tonight's uh, session work. We're going to have an interesting uh, time together tonight. We're going to talk about divine oneness. We're glad to see you uh, tonight. Have you have you had a good day? Are you awake, aware? Are you alive? Are you living, moving, and having your being in the Christ man, mind, and mystery? Welcome to Spirit and True Sanctuary where the whole household of God is welcomed uh, and wanted. We are in inclusion 101. If you remember, uh, before we began this series, we were in uh, Eckhart Tolle's A New Earth, uh, which is a, fa a fabulous study. We've been through it uh, several years ago. But uh, with the transition of the, of the late Bishop Carlton D. Pearson, there was such an outpouring of curiosity and openness to inclusion that we felt this was the right uh, shift to make. And so welcome. If you have questions tonight, you're in the right place. If you're inclusively minded, you're in the right place. If you're cautiously concerned, <laughs> praying for my salvation, you're in the right place tonight. So welcome wherever you're from. You're safe with us. Um, I did want to uh, begin tonight uh, with giving you some of the questions that we went through a couple of weeks ago. By the way, welcome everybody back. Uh, Brandy and I took a few days off last week. Uh, we were down at uh, in just the northern tip of Florida. It's called Amelia Island. Fabulous. Got to take our dogs down to the beach with us. And so thanks for letting us get a few days uh, rest. Well, Esther and I got a few days rest while Brandy worked the entire time. Uh, but it was nice being out of town. Eat what you can tonight. We're going to offer you a lot of food. Uh, you don't have to eat everything. Uh, I met Monday night uh, with some young seminarians um, at Morehouse College. And they were in very different places and spaces of, of acceptance, of understanding, a biblical approach, and they were all safe with me. Uh, and I'll say that tonight. Wherever you are, wherever your mind is in this moment, you're safe in this space. Change happens uh, to all of us, but at our own pace and in our own space. Religion tells us what to think. Spirituality teaches us how to think. We must be cognizant and vigilant. That's a good religious word. Be vigilant uh, not to become what we have come out of. In essence, when we, when we were more evangelical, our uh, approach was to convert everyone, to set people up, convert them, get them to think like we think, do like we do, believe like we believe. That cannot be and should not be the approach in uh, spiritu uh, inclusive spirituality. In essence, we are not here to convert you to inclusion. We're not even here to convince you. We're here to converse with you. And so eat what you can. Uh, you're in the right place at the right time tonight. Last week's questions uh, were very interesting. Question one, are assignations of Christian and him evidence that humans have created God in their image? Christian, thinking that if you are a Christian, you have a, a specific access granted to God that others don't have. Is that a man-made construct? And then the designations or assignations of him, a gendered deity, a gendered divine uh, presence. Uh, does, is that symbolic or symptomatic that we have created God in our image? Question two from last week. Are religiously minded individuals still the enemies of Jesus? If, if you follow historically uh, the life and teachings of Jesus, he was not ever really, uh, didn't have a lot of cross words with people he considered sinners, uh, the drunkards. You know, if you say drunkard, you go to church. You would just say somebody's a drunk. A drunkard, you read in the King James if you say drunkard. Uh, tax collectors, um, the wine bibbers, <laughs> the wine bibbers, yes. Uh, these were people that he felt fairly comfortable with. He didn't have a big issue with. Jesus really was in constant uh, tension with the religious order. And so the question is, are the religious-minded, both Christian and other religions who can be uh, literalistic in their approaches, uh, orthodoxy, are they still the enemies of the Jesus mindset or of the Jesus teaching? It was an interesting question. Question three, which religious ideologies enable our illusions of separation from God? Yeah, we talked last week about shame, uh, sin, guilt, 
perceiving uh, the anxiety of separation from uh, from source, what are the things that that keep us separated? Very cautiously, we talked about blood. Blood sacrifice kind of keeps us separated because we think there's always something that has to be done to reconnect us uh, to God or even to reconcile us to God. Uh, many rituals that we go through in, instill this idea that we must do things to be reconnected uh, to God in some ways. All right, uh, this week's question is we're going to talk about divine oneness. I'd love to hear your feedback, and uh, we're going to jump into the discussion together. Question one tonight can we be created in the image and likeness of God and also shaped in sin and formed in iniquity? Interesting question. Can we be created in the image and likeness of God and at the same time born in sin or shaped in iniquity? Is the way King James says it. Question two. Did Jesus come to save our souls or reconcile our minds? Or maybe you say yes to both. Did Jesus come to save souls Uh, or to reconcile our minds. Question number three, do all doors lead to green pastures? Interesting question, right? Yes, sometimes in uh, in the unity way of thinking and universalism and interfaith, we say all paths lead to God. I perceive some paths lead nowhere (laughs) to nothing uh, other than just self-actualization and the realization that we've accepted something that is no longer working. But do all doors or all paths lead us into green pastures? And what does that look like? The scripture says that uh, Jesus said, if any man be in me, he will come in and go out and find pasture. What does that look like? All right, I'm going to give you a quick announcement and uh, then I'm going to give it to you again at the end because it is a shameless plug and I don't mind doing it. Uh, Tomorrow night, uh, you can join us at Morehouse College, 7 p.m. in the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. International Chapel, Uh, for their non-violent Cosmic World House Assembly and induction ceremony where Bishop Carlton D. Pearson's portrait will be officially displayed. We've been waiting on this uh, this day for for many months. Uh, As a part of the ceremony, Pastor Clarice Palk uh, will be performing a piano duet with uh, Dr. Marva Carter, who is the wife of Dean uh, Lawrence Carter. And then to make it easy on everybody, if you're still interested, we have some spaces open. We've chartered a bus that will leave Spirit and Truth Sanctuary at 6 p.m. sharp, uh, take you right to Morehouse, drop you right off at the door uh, of the Martin King uh, Chapel. It's $20 per person, and there are spaces available. All you have to do is just come to the church, be here by 6 o'clock, get on the, get on the bus, and then ride right down to Morehouse. We'll bring you right back to your car uh, at Spirit and Truth Sanctuary. If you need more information, you can call the church uh, to get that information. All right, big deep breath, everybody. <clears throat> As we take and give this breath, we are in the awareness of the beginner's mind. We choose to walk into the kingdom as little children, uh, refusing the mastery and embracing the mystery. We, in this moment, celebrate truth as a journey and not as a destination. Our eternal, endless selves choose to empty out of indoctrinations and prejudgments or prejudices that keep us from the living well, the living word, the daily bread, the water that comes up out of our belly that flows into rivers of living water. God, we thank you tonight that we're able to celebrate uh, even the Buddhist idea of emptiness, the Zen Bardo space of liminal, uh, transitional, intersectional ideas from one idea to another, from one glory to another, line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little there a little. We are being transformed into the image and likeness of God and good. Amen, somebody. Amen. All right. Week 19, divine oneness. We're on pages 31 and 32 in Bishop Carlton Pearson's The Gospel of Inclusion. Just a little fun fact for you. Uh, Pastor Mike Williams is here tonight, so he, he knows. He actually told me about this. The original book, The Gospel of Inclusion, was to be entitled God is Not a Christian. And that became kind of the sequel to Gospel of Inclusion. Uh, But they wanted to kind of tone it down a little bit. (laughs) Uh, But if you read the Gospel of Inclusion, he says it over and over that God is not a Christian. So it eventually came out either way. Pages 31 and 32 uh, of the Gospel of Inclusion. This is a quote from uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer. It says, Intention is a force in the universe, and everything and everyone is connected to this invisible force. Any Star Wars fans 
out there, an invisible force, my, uh, Pastor Mike Williams, that connects or is interconnected with all things. It's And the interesting thing about the force is that it's not necessarily positive or negative. It just exists. It can be used in many different ways, just like energy. Energy is not necessarily positive or negative. It's the way that we channel that energy. And so intention is very similar to that. What is intention? It's not necessarily a positive thing in our lives. It's not a negative thing. It's how we channel intention. What do I mean by that? Intention is when we set our minds on something. We put something in the mind. We entertain it. We, we, we commit that thought uh, into kind of the, uh, the framework of our existence. And then with that intentionality, as we say yes to things, they begin to manifest around us. Uh, Jesus, uh, or, or sorry, uh, uh, Solomon would say this, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he, in the Proverbs, okay? Uh, Buddha would say that man is the sum total of all of his thoughts. In new thought, ancient or ancient or ageless wisdom, it would be as within, so without, as above, so below. Jesus of Nazareth would say it this way, on earth, in the material, as it is in the mental or in the spiritual thought realm, uh, in manifestation, okay, outwardly, as in imagination. All of this is pointing us back to, uh, to the, the, the rules or the ideologies around intention that is this invisible force. Bishop Pearson used to say it this way. When you say yes, the universe begins to conspire around your yes. Let's take the, the ant, uh, ant, antithesis of that. When you say no, your life begins to conspire around the no. And sometimes there is a, a powerful yes and just as powerful a no. There's some, some boundary identities that we need to understand in our lives. All right, let's jump right in. As far back as I can remember, we were taught to be like Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, I was never really sure what that meant, but I bought it. The confusing part was that we were also taught that we were made in the image and likeness of God. But we were to strive every day to be like Jesus, who was God in the flesh. Anybody see that, uh, that dichotomous trope there? So if we're taught to be like Jesus, but also uh, to, to, to strive to be like Jesus, but we're made in the image and likeness of God and good, if Jesus is God, how is that different? How, how are those things different? Well, a lot of us grew up under the, the, the construct that Jesus saves us from God, not necessarily reconnects us to God, but Jesus is somehow the intermediary. He is the middleman. He is the propitiation. He is the substitutionary atonement, the paschal lamb, saving us from the wrath, righteousness, holiness, judgment, uh, vengeance in some ways, punitive actions of God. And so most of us grew up kind of loving Jesus and being afraid of God. And yet the, tr the Trinitarian idea that didn't come into really being until about 400 BC, sorry, CE or common era, uh, gives us this idea that Jesus is God. That's the mystery, that the Godhead is three expressions. They are all different uh, versions or visions of God, but all somehow all God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Isn't it interesting that it doesn't say Father, Son, and Mother? You ever thought about that? Like, you got, you got a father. Now, you got a son. Well, where did the son come from? Who had the son get? Well, of course, the father spoke the son into existence. I get all that. Or in the beginning, the word was with God. You know, there's different ways to look at it. But we never want to see the Holy Spirit as the feminine sacred of God. I thought that was very interesting when I uh, kind of became aware of the patriarchal uh, subjectivities of the biblical writers. But in this framework, Bishop Pearson is asking, if we are to be like Jesus but yet we're made in the image and likeness of God, aren't we already like Jesus, who is God? Aren't we already carrying that divine DNA, that fingerprint uh, on the very, um, uh, in, in our very blood or in our very expression? All right, so listen to this. He says, uh, being like God always appeared to me to be out of reach. I never felt uh, like I could relate to God on a personal level, but Jesus was cool and seemed much more relevant to me. You've, have you seen those, um, those shirts that are fairly popular? It says, Jesus is my homeboy. Or uh, Jesus, uh, Doobie Brothers, Jesus is just all right with me. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi, I don't really care for Christians, but Jesus is all right, you know. So there, there's kind of a sentiment 
that there's this kind of austere God that's kind of untouchable. Uh, there's a lot of othering or otherness uh, to God, Bishop Pearson would say the etherness. Um, but in in the understanding of Jesus, it's more touchable. A high priest that has been tempted and always like us touched with the feeling of our infirmities. We can relate more when we hear uh, some of the teachings of Jesus. What is the difference uh, between Jesus uh, and God? Is is there a difference between Jesus and God? Uh, was Jesus divine? That was a really big Man, they went to blows over that. If you if you read um, some of the uh, the the some of the uh, <laughs> the writings that came around the Council of Nicaea, uh, there was even some fist fights that were recorded that that came out over uh, that ensued over the divinity of Jesus. Is Jesus divine? Is he fully God? Is he fully human? How does that? How do we even uh, 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 decipher this mystery that something can be fully this and fully that at the same time? I have my own thoughts about it, and I'll let, I'll let you kind of wonder about what those thoughts are. But the divinity of Jesus was not something that was even to be considered until about 400 years into, into, uh, into the early church. And so how do we, how do we decipher this dif- the differences between Jesus and God? We were taught oneness with God uh, was not a reality, but something to be achieved. Okay, so uh, uh, I believe uh, 2 Corinthians 3 Beholding in the mirror the the or, and when we turn sorry turn turn from basically from Moses or the Mosaic religious teaching we turn to Christ or to the Lord the veil is removed we now have a new freedom what is the freedom without this veil we have the freedom to behold in the mirror the glory of God that is the freedom the freedom is not necessarily going to the club or having a beer or you know, doing something that uh, we would think was carnal or worldly. That's not really contextually the freedom that is talked about here. The freedom is that we've been steeped in religion, and now that the veil of religion or the law is removed from our sight, we can behold in the mirror the glory of God. What is the glory of God? That we are made in the image and likeness of, of God and good. And so Bishop Pearson is really begging the question here, uh, is is oneness with God, is it a reality, or is it something we have to keep striving for? We could probably teach it both ways uh, biblically. We are being transformed into that image by the, uh, by the Spirit of God from glory to glory, iteration to iteration. It may not be, watch this, you are already the glory of God, but your acceptance of that may happen a little bit at a time. There is nothing you can do to be more made in the image and likeness of God. So in essence, it's not learning to be more like God. It's unlearning what somebody told you that wasn't God. So part of teaching is unteaching. Part of becoming your true divine self is letting go of some things that are obstacles keeping you from seeing uh, the truth that you've always known. It was not a birthright. This, of course, was to be achieved through Christ. Here again, Christianity is the institutional attempt to be like Jesus so we might someday be like God, and he put here again. So in essence, uh, Bishop Pearson has given us a little clue here that we're already like God. But somehow the eating of this knowledge uh, made us think that we were naked, ashamed, sinful, other, less than in some ways, Why did God even ask Adam and Eve, uh, who told you that you were naked? Yeah, how do you you perceive that you're less than good or made in the image and likeness of God? So that, that kind of relates to our first question tonight, or one of the questions. Did Jesus come to save our souls? Were our, are our souls in need of saving? Or did Jesus come to reconcile the mind or reconnect us to God in consciousness or both? Where are you with that? All right, keep coming. Of course, only a few would ever attain this coveted place, uh, and they would only be Christians naturally. Of course, yeah. Have you ever I asked the, uh, the young Morehouse seminarians Monday night, do you guys know any Calvinists? If you know Calvinistic thought, it's very, very, very dangerous the- theology, Calvinism is. Um, and so in Calvinism, there, is, there are predestined, pre-chosen, either vessels of honor, vessels of dishonor. You can't really do anything to change your status. It's kind of a preordained st- status uh, in, or, or state in life, very similar to Hinduism, 
uh, and the and the caste system, or the the idea of reincarnation that this life you can't do it. You're only paying your karma for what you did in the last life, and there's nothing you can do to improve your life in this. So that's a little bit of Calvinism even comes from Hindu Hindu uh, thought uh, of the of reincarnation and and karma or karmic uh, the karmic sowing and reaping process of a former life. So. Uh, in that way, I've never met a Calvinist who wasn't part of the ve- a vessel of honor. <laughs> I've never met a Calvinist who said, yeah, I'm a Calvinist, but I'm one of the vessels of dishonor. So in essence, w- what do we bring to the text? What do we, what do we project into uh, our, me- our ideologies and our theologies? Well, uh, I Actually, I've said Pastor Mike's name four times tonight, but he said to me a couple of days ago, uh, Bishop White was telling a story about his, one of his uh, predecessors and mentors that ha- had an understanding of former, former life expression and that he thought he was a merchant of some sort uh, in a former life. And Mike was just like, that is amazing. That makes me so happy to hear that because everybody who thinks that they were something in a former life was always a king. They were always a queen or a pharaoh or a president or what would you say? Cleopatra. They were always Cleopatra in a former life. Yeah. You never were just somebody who, you know, working for Amazon, you know, <laughs> just delivering the UPA, whatever, just a mailman, you know. I was, you were always, you know, you were Thomas Edison in the past life or George Washington Carver or somebody. So what that's saying to us is that we project sometimes things into something that may or may not be there. And so how, how do we uh, decipher that as we begin to look at ourselves? What are we projecting into our religious ideas, theologies, social constructs, gendered, ro- gendered roles, patriarchy, hierarchical systems of, of separation and, and segregation in the human family? Uh, all right, keep coming. Uh, by this thinking, uh, we were all created in the image and likeness of God, but lost that likeness, there we go, Eden, Eden lost, uh, through no fault of our own. And now we must find our way back to God, something that can only happen by accepting Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, which the, that phrase is never said in the Bible, personal Lord and Savior. What is, it's like a personal pan pizza. Remember that with Pizza Hut? What is a personal Lord and Savior? Isn't it personal to all of us somehow? But whatever, okay. Uh, the entire concept is blatantly exclusive and prejudicial. It is also demeaning to the power of Calvary. Whether you believe that God d- demanded or required blood sacrifice to atone, or whether you think Jesus did it to reconcile the mind, it is a blatant, overt slap in the face of Jesus that you think you did nothing to die in Adam, but you got to do all this work to be alive in Christ. Got to believe, got to confess, got to make a public confession. If you're ashamed of me before God, I'll be ashamed of you before, uh, before men. I'll be ashamed of you before the Father. We've, we take in all of these theologies and doctrines that are diminishing of the finished work of Calvary, yet we come in on Sunday morning and magnify the name of Jesus. How do, how do we reconcile this idea that we don't worship Adam on Sunday mornings? We don't talk about the power of Adam in our lives. But we believe that Adam's work was so powerful that we, did, even those who did not sin according to the likeness of the transgression are still dead in Adam. It's an, it's an imputed work. But we have to work. we got to do something. we got to add something to the work of Christ. We say all the time at Spirit and True Sanctuary, your faith, your confession does not save you. It awakens you to the truth that you have been saved. You are reconciled. What is, what's the point of faith? To wake up to the fact that you have been saved. That's the gospel of good news. All right. Keep coming. In the oneness of God, there is room for all. I love it. It includes much more uh, than any one religion contains. It is impossible for man to know all things, but I believe as William Blake does. Here's a quote from William Blake. In the universe, there are things that are known and things that are unknown. And in between, there are doors, intersections, uh, uh, tunnels, uh, passages, transitional, liminal spaces and moments uh, in our life. Here's the question for you tonight. Which door are you considering right now? Are you standing at a door? Have you entered a door maybe in a new space that doesn't seem to be working for you? Which intersection are you traversing? And here's, here's a question. Let's, let's be a little bit polemic tonight. Is Jesus the only door? 
Scripture records, Jesus says, I am the, um, I am the door. Uh, who, all who come into any other door are thieves and robbers. It's an interesting construct there, isn't it? Yeah, Jesus is kind of preaching some supremacy, some savior superiority uh, right there. Is Jesus the only door? Uh, if any man be in me, he will come in, go out, and find pasture. Are there ways to find pasture that are not connected to the Jesus construct? Interesting question. We'll talk about it tonight. If that is the case, uh, then there are doors that remain ajar through which uh, the curious can peek. I like the curiosity. Uh, the tragedy of theology is that it has closed these doors and robbed us of the mystery. I remember the first time that I heard Dr. Michael Beckwith say, relax your way into the mystery. In other words, let go of what you think you know let go of your preconditions, your concepts, your thoughts, your doctrines, your dictates, your dogmas, your catechisms. Let go and relax your way into the mystery, into the question. Relax your way into eating the manna, the mon, the what is it. The manna is the transitional moment that leads us into the promised land. What is the promised land? Is the promised land where all the answers are found? No. The promised land is a methodological framework that keeps us asking. And it's in that curiosity that we agree with our eternal, infinite selves. We don't put a period. We put a comma. God is continuing to speak. We, we, we um, accept an open canon that the Holy Spirit is still speaking. God is infinite spirit, infinite reality, and eternal design. This means that God is greater than any philosophical or religious concept. Can we just stop right there and say thank you, God, for Carlton Pearson? Let me read it again. This means that God is greater than any philosophical or religious concept. Thus, God is not a Christian. God is not necessarily even religious. Religions are formed for man to try to figure out God. We will never totally figure that out. And so we have to, at some point, embrace the idea that God, is, God cannot be confined to a religion or defined by a religious book or even religious characters, such as God, men, or Savior characters. Infinity uh, cannot be constrained to religion. Love it. However, uh, because we are religious creatures by nature, <laughs> our approach to God is rarely outside of that context. God, if God is omnipresent, then he is, she is, it is, everywhere at all times, encompassing all things and all beings. Thus, it is impossible for all men and women not to be one with God. And New Thought, they would, uh, the, the phrase is, God is evenly present throughout the universe at all times. Uh, even more revelatory is the fact that each of us represents part of the wholeness of the deity. So we all hold God within ourselves. There is no separation. Mm, 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 that's some good food to chew on tonight. All right, before we uh, open up tonight, I want to uh, read our uh, discussion questions again. Love to talk with you tonight. Come on, let's, let's, let's chop it up a little bit tonight. Question one, can we be created in the image and likeness of God and yet also be shaped in sin and in iniquity? Can those dichotomies even rest in the same space? Question two, did Jesus come to save our souls or reconcile our minds? Interesting. Question three, do all doors lead to green pastures? Does every door that we walk through lead us into a green pasture? All right, let's talk tonight. One, two. Uh, hey, hey. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Pastor Brandy wanted me to make sure that I welcomed everybody from afar. So the ones that I have noticed that are not uh, in the immediate Atlanta area, our Enlightenment is with us tonight from Trinidad and Tobago. Wow. Michael Morgan from Northern Ireland and Andy Allison from East Texas. Yeah, so if yeah, there's yeah. anyone else joining us from afar, please let me know. But we welcome everyone. All right. So Jason Jacobs, uh, answer to number one. He's from New York. OK, yeah. so he's from afar as well. Mm -hmm. He says, according to the narrative, we were created in the image and likeness of God. God has the knowledge of good and evil. So if we were created in his image, maybe we also have had the knowledge of good and evil since the very beginning, mm. even before Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit. Wow, Jason, I love that. Yeah. So was there a magical 
moment that we became more like God? You know, in that framework, uh, Jason, this is difficult for people to hear, but the serpent did not lie to Adam and Eve. You know, it's painted mosaically as uh, <laughs> he's the most cunning, crafty beast, beast or creature of the field. But the truth is that the, the serpent did not lie. Let's take it in context, okay? First of all, this, when the serpent said to them, you will not die, he told them the truth. The scripture is not that you will die eventually. It will, not that, it will not be that you will spiritually die or that you will understand the concept of death. It says specifically in context, on the day, in the day that you eat of this tree, you will die. So contextually, it's a 24-hour uh, block of time. They didn't die for almost a thousand years. So number one, the serpent didn't lie about that. You're not going to die. Secondly, the serpent says, if you eat of this, you will be like God knowing the difference between good and evil. And that's exactly what happened. And so uh, the devil is not a lie. <laughs> or at least the, this devil construct we have in the Garden of Eden, it wasn't necessarily lying to them. Uh, what, if, what if we had the knowledge of good and evil? What if all that knowledge was within us and something just uncovered it at some point? All, all of that uh, is really allegorical. I think probably you understand that, Jason. Uh, it comes from uh, s- some of the uh, tropes of Mises or Mises, uh, who was an Egyptian uh, deliverer just like Moses, who gave us the, the Ten Laws of Hammurabi, which is basically the Ten Commandments that predate Moses. And so it's okay for us to admit that maybe Moses' understanding of the, of the Genesis narrative was taken from some Egyptian lore or mythology, and we kind of borrowed some of that. But guess what? It's all good. It's all God. It's all for our benefit in some way. That's a great question, Jason. Thanks. Okay, next, uh, B. Woke answered number three by saying, some doors lead to green pastures, some not, because sometimes we make the fear choice. The growth choice leads us to green pastures or to the greater consciousness. Yeah. That's good, uh, Be Woke. So in essence, some doors lead to nothing. Some doors lead to other doors. Some doors lead to very difficult lessons that if we believe that things are working together for our good, we still count it all as, all as good in some ways. Uh, and then some doors actually do lead to green pastures. And so are those doors always intrinsically connected to the Jesus narrative? Uh, did Gandhi walk into some green pastures of self-actualization, service to mankind that wasn't primarily or at least initially or originally through a Jesus door. There's a quote, one of my favorite uh, Dr. Howard Thurman quotes, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, goes something like this. It says, uh, many men, humanity, will connect to God in different ways. Some will connect to God through, through nature, some through good works, but on their journey, if they, if they have a true search for God, they will bump into Jesus along the way. Meaning, if you're a Hindu, if you're a Muslim, if you're a Buddhist, Buddhist, at some point, if you have a true search for God, you're going to bump into Jesus because the, the teaching of Jesus of Nazareth is undeniable. If you're a seeker of truth, whatever religion you're in, you probably will bump into Jesus at some point. What I would add to that Dr. Howard Thurman is if... If you are truly a seeker of truth and you're a Christian, you're going to have to bump into Mahatma Gandhi. You're going to have to bump into Siddhartha Gautama. You're going to have to bump into Sri Krishna or Rumi or Hafiz. You will have to bump into these other uh, um, enlightened beings because if truth is really your journey, it cannot be contained into any specific religion. I love that. Thanks for sharing. Okay, next from Lorraine Mamola, and I'm gonna I'm jumping around. I don't I, th- I don't have. I think Lorraine. It, there's a Lorraine Jackson and a Lorraine. She may be in uh, either Newark or uh, or New York as well. I'm not sure, but. Okay, welcome, so Lorraine. she she answers number three. I do not believe all doors lead to green pastures, but rather we must choose the doors that lead us to the best version of ourselves for the collective good of humanity. Hmm. I love that. Yeah. So. Uh, the question, uh, Lorraine, that you just brought to us in paraphrased form is really the theme of our of Spirit and Truth for this year. How do we know if we walk through the right door? 
How do we know if it's a green pasture or not? Did we make the right choice? Is it scripturally sound? We, we can argue that all day. Is it the right philosophy? I don't know. You might be Aristotelian or Socratic with that. Who knows what the right one is? How, what's the only way that we know if we walk into a green pasture? Is it working for you? Are you experiencing righteousness, peace, and joy? And if you're experiencing that, you have walked into the kingdom of God, no matter what door you walked into. Love it. Thanks, Lorraine. Okay, and there's actually one more from her. Um, Number one, God is God is not shaped in iniquity. So if we are created in God's image, it is impossible for us to be. We mm. just have to tune into the divinity that is within each of us to manifest the God or Christ in us. Look at that argument there. Yeah. yeah. So if we are made in the image and likeness of God, how can we be shaped or formed in sinfulness or in iniquity? So we tap into a very damaging <laughs> church doctrine of fallenness, wretchedness, separation from God. We take all that from the Genesis allegory or metaphor uh, in, the, in the garden, but that is a great point. So in that framework, uh, we are not necessarily sinful or even shaped in iniquity, even through Adam. However, we perceive that we are. If we perceive that we are, then our perception becomes our reality, even if it's not the ultimate truth. That's one thing that Bishop Pearson said all the time. Uh, perception is not the ultimate truth, but it might be your ultimate reality. Uh, my late bishop, uh, Archbishop Polk, would say this. Uh, so I've said this many times this week. Sincerity is no basis for truth. You can be sincerely deceived. So if you're sincere about your fallenness, that's what you're going to ex experience in your life. I am fallen. I am separate from God. If you're sincere about your divinity, you'll experience the, the divine in your life. And so there are many doors that lead to different spaces. Is being fallen working for you? Is being shaped in iniquity and living in guilt, is it working for you? Well, no, it's not. That's why I need Jesus so much. Is blood sacrifice work? Do, do you have to worship a bloodthirsty God because God demands blood to forgive? All of that at the end of the day is going to crumble. And what we're going to be left with is the emptiness and openness of coming back to the beginning. We started off in spiritual oneness. We had to go through all these different iterations, law, prophets, John, Jesus, Paul, finally all the way back around cyclically to where we began in spiritual oneness with God. Thank you. Okay, from our brother Michael Morgan in Northern Ireland, he said, <clears throat> would these thoughts best fit into a pantheistic view of God, i.e. the universe is God and God is the universe? Hmm, interesting, yeah. Uh, pan pantheism, uh, which comes to us primarily from uh, Greek mythology, uh, the, the assembly of the gods, uh, yeah, all, Zeus, and then even, even some of that, uh, Michael, even comes into God-men, that, that the gods, <laughs> the pantheistic, even having uh, sex with humans, even in our, even in our scripture, even in, the, uh, even in the canonized scripture that, that, that I read, uh, the, the sons of God, angels or some type of divine expressions, went into the daughters of men. They produced a race called the Nephilim, which we perceive that that might have been Goliath. And then, I don't know if you've ever heard this story, but um, when David went to s confront Goliath, he took five stones, but he hit him, he hit him with the first stone. And so preachers always say, why did David take four of the stones for Goliath's other four brothers? And that, has, that is actually not scriptural in any way. <laughs> People make that up because they're, they're a little bit of, evidence here and then that they thought Goliath had brothers. Uh, anyway, if it preaches good, preach it. Who cares? You know, preach it. But uh, panth that pantheistic idea of the interconnectedness of God, universe, even even nature, some of that. Uh, yeah, how, do, how does all that uh, meet us on these doors that lead to things? You know, I don't really have uh, a specific opinion because I don't I try not to have a lot of beliefs, uh, but be the spirit that's capable of considering beliefs. Uh, but yeah, there, there may be an interesting connection, at least in the framework of the human consciousness. Thanks, Michael. Okay, and there's a, a follow-up uh, question from him. He says, so is God dynamic, unfolding, creating a verb and not a noun? Mm, dynamic, unfolding. So uh, here's, here's the interesting, I'll, I'll kind of answer that with a question. Uh, the universe is still expanding. 
That's amazing that even that somehow quantum physicists even know that, Michael. But the universe is still is still expanding. Expanding into what? Into where? Where is the universe expanding into? And is there an end to it? And if the universe is still expanding, is God still expanding? Don't know that we even want to talk about that question, but is God still and what is the purpose of 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 incarnations? Other than other than recon, things like reconciliation, uh, saving people, you know, all of that idea of holiness and righteousness and separation. But why do divine spirits incarnate? And if we, according to the Christian di- uh, dynamic, uh, if if we are saved, why are we still here? Well, we're waiting. We're trying to make the earth God's footstool and bring Jesus back to the earth. A lot of that is is uh, the the kind of uh, literalistic interpretations of the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel. But the truth is that we don't know why we're still here. The eclipse happened a couple of days ago. All the Christians are ready to go. I, I told, I told I, that I try not to enjoy these things as much as I do, but I do enjoy them. But uh, I read a meme that said, well, if the rapture does happen, the earth will immediately be a better place because all the Christians will be taken out and we'll learn <laughs> How to get along, we'll learn to be at peace with each other and not, not be so hierarchical. So how do, we, how do we decipher that? I really don't have a specific answer for that. I think that uh, in that, in that interconnectedness, uh, Michael, that maybe there is some dynamic uh, uh, coming from the Greek word um, uh, dunamis, meaning some even power in some ways, uh, coming from the Latin and then the Greek. And so in that power exchange, in that ever-evolving is God still unfolding? Is God well? The God in us is still unfolding. That's why we incarnated. If you've read uh, Conversations with God, Neil Donald Walsh asked the question: If we came from spirit, why did we come here? Why incarnate in the first place? Because if we don't know know the self, how do we ever really know who we are? So we begin to know ourselves through these incarnations. And so we came from spirit. I believe we're going back to spirit. We're in this world to further unfold as divine creatures. Is God still unfolding? I'm not going to answer that one specifically, but thanks, Michael. (laughs) Okay, now we have an interesting comment from B. Woke. Uh, When we talk about doors, we're talking about free will. Hmm. Doors, free will, uh, agency, our divine agency uh, to choose, to create, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's some interesting juxtaposition between deterministic thought and, and the agency of, of the human spirit. So in, determ- in deterministic thought, it is that everything, you're just basically a product of your environment. You are just kind of uh, uh, the sum total of your lived experiences. You can only do so much because of the way that you were nurtured uh, and where you come from geographically. Uh, philosophically, politically, all of that is determinism. But in free will, we find this ability, if we don't like our lives, we can recreate it. We can own it, hone it, reshape it, recreate our lives anytime we realize that we are created by God, creative like God, and creating as a God. So in that free will, we can create, walk through the doors that we think are going to produce happiness in our lives. Where that becomes a little dangerous for me, at least in theological circles, is that by our free will, we have to choose Jesus. We have to choose salvation. We have to choose to say the sinner's prayer. That's where free will kind of stops with me uh, in my theological uh, exploration, is that, yes, we are divine creatures, but that free will sometimes gets turned around and becomes a manipulation uh, in pulpits to be fear, uh, a fear tactic, you have a free will. You have to choose. Well, you didn't choose to die in Adam, but you got to choose by your free will to be in Christ. But in the narrative you brought, uh, I love that. Yes, it, the doors are free will. We can choose to create the lives that we want to experience. Okay, another one from Lorraine Mamola. She says, fundamentalism teaches us not to question anything, that all those questions come from the devil who they give more power to than the one God above all. (laughs) And then underneath that, that. Kim C. says back to her, I feel like we were taught that the devil has more power than Jesus and God. Uh, Bishop Pearson would say, uh, we can't even have good church without the devil. How are you going to have good church without making the devil out of a lie? 
without putting the devil under your feet or rebuking the, de- rebuking the devourer for your sake. Yeah. Um, yeah. How do we, how do we kind of wrestle with this big God idea and a little bit smaller devil that might slip up and, you know, God might be sleeping one day and the devil being busy working at night, working hard at night because he knows his time is short. God's going to lose the universe and 80% of creation is going to the devil's hell. The other 20% will be in heaven at some point. Well, really, then that makes devil the devil God. The devil should be in charge because his work is more effective than the work of God. So in the, in the oneness thinking, because we're talking about spiritual oneness tonight or divine oneness, we don't perceive that the universe is split into different gods. That comes to us from Zoroastrianism that bleeds into, uh, Star Wars is the theme tonight, you know, the, 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 the force is kind of divided into, uh, you know, the rebellion and the, um, you know, the Republic, or, and, you know, there's Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker. And at any point we could just lose control and Darth Vader's going to win somehow. But also watch this in the end, <laughs> that which we perceived as evil, Darth Vader came back to his true essence and nature came back to the, the Anakin before the ego took over. So in uh, actually in inclusion, where inclusion comes from, we call it universal salvation, ultimate reconciliation, the restoration of all things. It comes from the Greek word apokatastasis, which, uh, which was popularized by the early church father, St. Gregory of Nyssa, or Nyssa. Gregory of Nyssa not only believed that all of creation, humanity, would be reconciled or restored back to its original um, intention, Gregory, St. Gregory of Nyssa taught through apocastasis that became universal salvation that even the devil would be reconciled to God. And so we could probably make a pretty strong case for that scripturally that we see God using this devil idea for the benefit of the saints at times. And so in, in that way, um, I would bring to us this, and this is just I know this is cliche, but this is something I, lo- I like from New Thought Teaching. Until you perceive that there's only one power in the universe, you will never have power. What does that mean? As long as you perceive a God and a devil, a divided universe, you will never really wake up to or hone your own crea- divine creativity or divine capacity to create the life that you want. Scripture says that a little bit differently. It says this, uh, how can a house divided stand? Uh, how can two rulers be in the same space or uh, watch this a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways how long will you vacillate between two different opinions all of that is is similar kind of archetypes of saying there's only one power in the universe we choose to walk in that one power that's good thanks all right this one is from laverne bryant uh, from number one we are created in our creator's image but being human we also have faults and imperfections. The thing is to recognize it and do the best to make better lives for our families. Hmm, interesting. So Laverne brings to us maybe um, a little bit of a nuance that even though we're creating the image and likeness of good, that there is this kind of humanity about us, okay? And that, that we do the best we can with that. And some of that, Laverne, I would offer to you just as food for thought, these are a little bit uh, of, of choices that we make. We kind of choose to give in to what we call our humanness. If you look, if I can offer to you kind of the, uh, the prototype of Jesus of Nazareth, uh, scholars from, uh, excuse me, theologians from about, from about uh, the 5th century CE began to really want to, to really say that Jesus was sin- sinless. Jesus did not sin was tempted in all ways, but never, but without sin in some ways. I don't find that in my reading and study of what's recorded about Jesus. I find that Jesus was prejudicial. I find that Jesus was uh, uh, misogynistic. That was the culture of his day. I find that he was uh, hierarchical, only the only came for the Jews, xenophobic. I don't deal with the Syrophoenicians or or, or the Samaritans. That's not for me. But there was also something greater in Jesus that was waking up. So maybe that's that's a good uh, a good um, um, excuse me example Lorraine uh, is that Lorraine or Laverne uh, of seeing that we can be human and still divine, but was the humanness of Jesus born into him, 
or was it something he learned in his cultural exp- exposure? Is it, did, he, did he learn, was he born a Jew, or was he conditioned to be a Jew? Was he born with misogynistic ideas, or did a patriarchal society uh, indoctrinate and culturalize him to be misogynistic? So, some of what we experience as human, Laverne, I perceive, is not necessarily who we are, it's who we've been taught to be. We were not taught to be, we were not born prejudicial. We were not born homophobic. We were not born uh, stingy. Or somebody asked me one time, well, how, how, do, how, if you don't believe we're born fallen, why does a child know to throw a fit? I said, who taught a child to smile? Well, who taught a child to take his toy from, from another child that, that wants to play with a toy? Who taught a child how to hug, how to embrace? They're, the glass is always half empty and always half full. And so we choose to feed the higher wolf, the higher self, but yeah, that, that's a great example. And I think we can apply that uh, to the example we have of Jesus of Nazareth. Thanks, Lorraine. Laverne, sorry. All right. So Mary Hayes, uh, in an answer to number three, says, and this goes to what you were just talking about choosing, I think doors can't always lead to greener pastures because I believe it is how we think, negative or positive, and how much contrast I allow into my life. Hmm. The contrast, yeah. What, what, and what creates that contrast. Uh, I was having a conversation in the car today about the separation of light and darkness and that, you know, what, what fellowship does light have with darkness? And so, and someone said, well, how does a shadow even exist? It is a part of the light or it's just an obstacle getting in the way of the light. And so in that way, a shadow is intrinsically interconnected to light. I, I love that, Mary. What is it that creates the contrast? Is the contrast for our benefit? Uh, well, probably not in the framework of being scared of the devil or rebuking the devil the rest of your life, but the contrast of our higher and lower selves. Do I want to agree with my divine nature or am I in more of agreement with, my, with this lower conditioning and cultural context that I've uh, been raised in? I like that, Mary. It's a great way to approach that. Okay, this is a great uh, one, again, from Michael Morgan. It says, what if the doors are opportunities we choose or we chose? The devil is an agent of God to enable us to choose. So in this, the devil isn't against God, but God's agent. Just a thought. <laughs> the devil is the, uh, is the allowance, or in that way, Michael, we could say the devil is the free will. <laughs> Uh, so are we robots? Are we pre-programmed uh, um, to just follow whatever God tells us to do? Or are we here to learn something through this devilish free will or this agency uh, to, to choose? Uh, if you've seen the movie The Devil's Advocate, which is one of my favorite movies, you can kind of see uh, even the, um, uh, the character, that, uh, what's the actress, the Al Pacino who plays the, uh, the devil, kind of there's some evil that you sense but there's also some pressing toward good and kind of bringing out in the Keanu Reeves character like forcing him to see his higher self in that in that way Michael um, when Jesus was driven into the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4 he was driven by the spirit to be tested or tempted by the devil why would the spirit drive Jesus push Jesus into a, a demonic or devilish encounter. Well, the truth is it wasn't really the devil. The original language, which was not Aramaic, uh, sorry, it was not um, Greek, it was Aramaic. It comes to us in the Caboris manuscript, which we only have little, little sections of. It's, it's kind of like the Dead Sea Scrolls. It wasn't all preserved. But some of the Caboris manuscript was, was uh, preserved. And in that, in that Matthew chapter 4, in this manuscript, where it says devil or Satan, in the Kaboris manuscript, the Aramaic word is akudsha, which means uprightness. So let's apply that into theologically and linguistically or, or hermeneutically into this story. Jesus was then driven by uprightness. <clears throat> what is uprightness? And who translated that devil? So in the, in the original understanding, that uprightness was doing what? Helping Jesus get rid of his ego, 
deal with his need, his desire for fame, fortune, notoriety, the need for power, glory. So absolutely the devil is being used for God, for God's purposes. Jesus comes out of the wilderness. He went in the son of man. I perceive he came out the son of God. It says immediately he was preaching, teaching with power, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So in essence, he had a 40 day revival with the devil and came out purged and cleansed and ready to to kind of embody that higher spiritual nature. In that way, we say, Michael, devil, get behind me and push. Push me into my destiny. Transport me into my higher self. That's great, Michael. Okay, we don't have any more questions, uh, but I just want to end with one final comment, which I especially liked from Kim C. She says, thank you, Bishop, for saying you don't know. I would rather hear that as an answer instead of how some pastors and teachers will twist scripture to create an answer. Yeah, that, thank you for noticing that, Kim. I, I think that's a safe um, approach. I don't know that any of us ever uh, uh, really attain pure objectivity. Uh, I think it's hard not to bring our lived experiences and project them into the text. I'll give you a quick example of this. Um, as a, uh, uh, people who come from oppression, they're going to kind of project into the scriptures a God who is nigh to the oppressed. People who come from privilege are going to project into the scriptures, well, if you make the right decisions, then, you know, God's going to help, God's going to, if, you're, if you follow the law, if you do these things, you're going to be blessed. If you are a woman and you come into womanist theology, you're going to project into the scriptures that God is egalitarian. God is not male or female. You're going to connect to the fe feminine sacred. Uh, feasibly. If you are uh, of the same gender loving community, LGBTQIA, you're going to project into the scriptures a, a desire to be creative and nuance some of what we call the hate scriptures uh, in that way. If So if, in essence, there is a tendency in, in the framework of our study of scripture to not approach it objectively, but to, to bring to it our subjectivity. What are we trying to make the scripture say? So in that way, there is no textual neutrality. <laughs> we see in the Bible ourselves. We don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we are. And so how do we, how do we find a textual neutrality? Is it even possible uh, to do that? Uh, I, I perceive that as uh, Dr. King talked about universal altruism, that our, our gender, our sexual orientation, our race, our geography, all of these are secondary considerations or what Dr. King said are external accidents. If we can be cognizant of these secondary considerations and of these external accidents, at least we bring an awareness to the text. And we're not just blatantly projecting into the text what we want it to say. Uh, in that way, we have to say we don't know, right? We have to say, yeah, I... This, I can teach the Bible from a lot of different spaces. You know, Jesus said this, but, you know, it could mean several different things. Paul is all over the place theologically. If you want to say, well, I, I follow the teachings of Paul. Really? Which one? Women be silent in church or there is no male or female in Christ? Which, which Paul are you talking about here? You know, so in that way, if, if we say, I don't know, if we practice emptiness in the beginner's mind, then we're able to at least achieve a little bit more ob objectivity as we approach the text without projecting uh, ourselves or our lived experiences into the text. I love that, that you picked up on that. Look, look at God. Won't he do it? Won't she do it? All right, is that it for tonight? Thanks for an amazing discussion. Thanks for the questions tonight. I uh, look forward to uh, connecting with you guys again. Remember, I want to give you one more quick announcement tomorrow night at Morehouse College. Um, Bishop Carlton D. Pearson's portrait will be inducted in, uh, into the hall of, uh, into the Morehouse halls there. We'd love to see you down there. I'll be there. If you're there, come say hello to me if you'd like to. If you want to ride to, uh, to Morehouse, meet at Spirit and Tree Sanctuary at 6 p.m. It's just 20 bucks. We'll take you right to the front door, bring you right back, uh, to your car when it's over with. Um, and also, I want to give you guys a chance to give tonight. Uh, if you've received something in the teaching tonight. There should be, I don't know if Benny's, Benny's got that information there for you. You should be able to, uh, to, to access that pretty quickly. If you've eaten at the table tonight, then, then, then pay for that food. Don't, don't get up and run out without paying your bill. Uh, support what we're doing. We believe that we are modeling uh, the ideas of inclusion uh, in, a, in a material way. 
Uh, even though we are virtual, there's, there's five people in the room right now helping me do this virtually. Uh, we have to be in a space. We have to have uh, lights and cameras and, and a Wi-Fi. And, yeah, it's just no, nothing from nothing leaves nothing. Okay, Nothing is ever really necessarily for free. There is a process of sowing and reaping. So give something back tonight uh, if you can. Before we are dismissed, I want to uh, read our closing affirmation together. I don't know if you have that ready, Benny. Let's read it together. I am open to seeing a different perspective of God and of Scripture and of myself. I have been reconciled to God. Now I will make my peace with God in my mind. There it is. Jesus did not come to save me from God, but to save me from myself, to deliver me from religion, mm -hmm, and to reconnect me to God in consciousness. Mm -hmm. I will consider the idea that Christ's work of life is greater than Adam's work of death. You know what get, got Carlton and Carlton Pearson in trouble is just saying that they were equal. All he said was Jesus was equal to Adam. Imagine us magnifying Jesus, how much trouble we're going to get into. All right, keep with me. The good news is that the bad news was wrong. If all died in Adam, all will live in Christ. The world is saved, whether they know it or not. As a minister, as a messenger of reconciliation, my job is not to save anyone, but to spread the good news that salvation is a finished work. Now get up off that stuva. Get somewhere and sit down. How your mama and them doing? <laughs> How you dying today? We love you guys. Looking forward to connecting with you again uh, tomorrow night uh, at Morehouse College. Friday morning, 7 a.m. is our devotion. And then Sunday morning, 10 a.m. right here at Spirit and Truth Sanctuary. We love you guys. Go in peace. Have a great night.